This is going to be Series 1, Milos Raonic. Remember him from 2013 and even as far back as 2011 when he went deep in the Australian Open. Uh, I believe he was just a qualifier and he was using the Wilson K-Blade. Now, I'm not too sure where uh, his ranking is nowadays. I think it's because of a lot of injuries and other factors. We're going to get into that now. I feel like I was a little too extreme about his ranking now. Because, I mean, he's still ranked 14 on the ATP website. Um, his career high was as high as uh, 3. And that was four years ago. It's just that... At that time, I was used to him going deep in the quarterfinals of several slams, semifinals, and even the finals of Wimbledon, where he lost Andy Murray in uh, tiebreakers. So his results as of now just made it seem like his ranking dipped significantly, uh, even lower than the uh, position that he's in right now. And I think he did, actually. So let me double check the rankings he um, in 2020 during the height of the pandemic he was fluctuating between 35 and uh, 30 and even like yeah 35 19 that range um, yeah he never went out of the top 50 but he definitely went out of the top 20 and uh, potentially could have been out of the seeding possibilities because he was like 35 and 32 is the lowest seed. So his ranking did dip from what I remember because of in 2016, he was consistently in the top 10 uh, doing very good. And people were thinking he would win the slam like Wimbledon, I mean, eventually because of his serving and he innovated his game with the serve and volley. So what happened? That's what we're trying to discuss and figure out. And hopefully, maybe, um, if he does work on these things, he'll get back into that winning circle and give himself more possibilities, you know? <laughs> so I want to do something where, since it is the first video, I'm going to make that timeline. And I'm going to make it from around the beginning of his career, from around 2011, or even 2008, 2011, that time period, and then go all the way to roughly now, which is 2020. So we'll have uh, 12, 10 to 12 years broken down in this first episode. And I'm going to break it down into three segments where I think Milos's game is right now. And the goods and bads of all of them, I think. And from there, we should get a good idea of how he can improve. So, I mean, the first era was around when he was still qualifying for matches. I know uh, Milos's parents are very well educated. And, yeah, they planned out his career. They had him qualify in a lot of tournaments. And then he did go deep in the Australian Open. One of the first ones he went to reached the at least the third round. And that was from having all this potential right uh one of his biggest assets is the forehand and a lot of people were saying he strung his racket very tight and this was at the time when he was sponsored by lacoste he defeated andy murray um one time and then uh 2012 he lost i think four sets to andy murray so it was he was doing pretty good he was playing a good game the main thing I noticed when I watched him in 2013, when he reached the finals of Montreal, he had a lot of pace and he had a lot of spin. And most importantly, he had this raw talent, you know? Um, so that was the first set of time that I want to talk about, which is, I know so much potential. The only thing I, I saw maybe as a downside was just, it wasn't fully molded yet, meaning like he as a player wasn't defined yet. He didn't have, like we didn't know him yet. It's like, oh yeah, he was a big server. He was, 
you know, the guy who rushed the net yet, he was still figuring it out because he was still qualifying, trying to get um, into the draws directly, right? So let's move on to the next part. This is when uh, conversations of him, Dimitrov, and Nishikori were all brought up because they were the next uh, set of players, hopefully, to become Grand Slam champions and then, you know, create uh, a new set of, like, top players. So I don't know why people thought that. while well, they were going deep and they were fairly young. That was the main thing. Um, and then this is at the time when Milos's forehand really developed as well as his uh, serving. I definitely think Milos really needs to work on at that time, it was like the back end. I felt like a lot of times he would hit around it. He would try to do inside out forehands, but a lot of times, if that wasn't executed well, uh, the point would get compromised and the rally would be worse off, let alone get reset back to like a neutral baseline rally. So he needed to work, he was working on that. And at the time, I believe he was working on the, fo the footwork as well those two aspects of his game because he was a lot bulkier as in he had a lot more muscle mass and strength at that time he was had a lot of raw potential um so this second time period i'm talking about is from you know late 2013 to the end of uh 2017 and i noticed a big change it was around 2014 2016 that time period this was when he was reaching the quarters of Roland Garros and he was wearing those like New Balance geometric polos Yeah, he was playing really good um, I noticed it's because he improved the footwork like I was saying his diet changed he slimmed down uh, this is when he was wearing that sleek haircut and then he dropped the bandana uh, his game was solid he was beating a lot of players he was losing to Murray more than he was when he was like more raw of a player. I think it could just be Murray was figuring him out at the time because he was explosive. But um, maybe his game just got less dangerous to Murray. But other than that, he definitely improved a lot. He beat more players. He won more titles. Uh, he would have had more titles if the SAP Open was still going, but... The one uh, closed. So he was playing good. He was going deep in Canada. And he also reached the finals of Wimbledon, as I mentioned. And that was because he developed into the player that he was not yet at the time during the phase one. He was now in phase two, a uh, servant volleyer with a heavy forehand. Uh, and that he turned... A potential liability which was a slice backhand into an asset because it helped him get into the service box area in serve and volley so he improved on that he tried to make everything possible he made everything sort of work towards his favor he had Yvonne uh, the player who coached Roger after um, and it was a good combination they worked on that So I don't, I don't know what else he could have done at the time. Maybe work further on the movement, but his movement did improve a lot. And unfortunately, he did have injuries. I believe that was from wear and tear, and he was maybe not used to his body being so different now on the tour that the adjustments were too great. It put a lot of stress, and he had a lot more uh, surgeries in the phase two time period. I remember that. Another thing, uh, let's go to the phase three. This is the current phase from 2018 to 2020. And you can follow with me if you want. It's on the ATP rankings history. If you check out, uh, you know, late 2017, starting from August 21st, this is when he dropped out of the top 10. And then... He drops out of the top 20 in 
uh, November, November 6, 2017. And he drops as low as uh, 40 in uh, February 26, 2018. He rises, he dips a little bit again back to 30 around August 13th, 2018. And he gets back into the top 20 September of that same year. And now he's sort of in between the 40 and 20 consistently. And yeah, this is very different than his original trajectory, right? Because he was before just going up basically from since 2000, you could say 2007, all the way up to 2014, you know? The reason why is, I think, the phases. So phase one was the rawness was already um, very different than all those other players in the future tournaments. Like, they couldn't handle the big serve and the big forehand. So getting those easy points made him just better. And then phase two, he could surprise a lot of players with the new forehand and the sleekness. But then phase three... Um, this is what a lot of players struggle with, I think, is the longevity part of the career. So Ramage, now that I think he regained some mass and his coach setup has changed, he's no longer with uh, Carlos Moya and Ivan. So his whole setup changed again. I think that made him in this weird standby phase or like he was developing into a player and because the coaches that were developing him left, the new coach, or the coach who was with him this whole time, they can't really get him to, like, to complete that full process. And not just that, it's hard to shift it back to the original process. So he's kind of like, it's like fluctuating, you know? Like, I wonder what would have happened if the coaching arrangement stayed the same, like all the three coaches were there. But yeah, you never know, that's hindsight. <laughs> So I think now it's like a lot of players have better understood the roundage serve and roundage is older now, you know. So this is phase three. I feel like he's a little a little slower on a little bit of everything. And the serve is more predictable. So his strengths have not improved. And he has a little bit of a decline in terms of like the rate of improvement because of the environment within his camp. And just people getting younger around him, meaning newer players and stuff. So what do you think? How do you think Ranish can go past this uh, phase three and get into the winning circle? I think Ranish should rehire Carlos Moya or somebody similar. Someone maybe from uh, Carlos's circle and then get that same mentality back. Or even Yvonne, because uh, I know Yvonne was coaching Roger. He could just be like, you know, they can alternate. They could share the coach. That's what Ernest Golbis and Dominic Team did. So you never know. That could happen. I think in the long run, that would help him, especially during uh, the off season when they're not traveling as much. They could always um, meet up sometimes, like fly over. And I think it would really help him. So what do you think? I hope this was uh, interesting to listen to. Thanks for tuning in.